Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Hope everyone's doing well out there. Uh, today's guest is Kevin Carr from Movement is Medicine and Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning, CFSC. So, Kevin, go ahead and uh, give the listeners a little bit of a background on yourself there. Yeah. Uh, well, first off, thank you for having me, guys. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up here in the Boston area. I've been working here at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning for over 12 years now. I just turned 33 last week. And uh, it dawned on me how long I've been working here now, when each birthday goes by. And I'm a massage therapist, educator as well through Certified Functional Strength Coach and Movement as Medicine. So um, three jobs under one roof here at uh, Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. Well, happy belated birthday. So well, let's get Thank that out right much. first. So the me- Movement as Medicine, what was the thought process behind naming your business that yeah it's interesting brendan rerick and i started that together probably about seven years ago now we were in college and we first thought of this up it was a gen ed class we didn't care about and we were <laughs> we were reading like <laughs> e-myth and we were reading crush it from gary v and we both looked at each other and said we're gonna start a business and that's when i had already been at mbsc he was working at a competitor and we had a professor uh our freshman year that had a an article he wrote about exercise and diabetes and it was called movement as medicine or using movement as medicine and we that kind of stuck with us and then when we kind of went to massage school and tried to figure out what we want to do and how we want to incorporate that into strength and conditioning our whole thought process is like we want to use this as a tool so you can exercise more and be healthier right like massage and manual therapy was a tool to to get people back to, to exercise and so that's really how that name came and then how that whole concept of, of our manual therapy business kind of kind of came from. Awesome. Do you find that there's kind of a uh, hesitation for people to move more? Like, especially people that are kind of dealing with injuries, chronic injuries, so to speak, they're actually afraid to move. I, I'll rem- always remember when I, the turning point I had, uh, when I had a guy who came in, because I mean, we are a massage business and a movement, like we really promote, if you look at our social media, we we're mostly promoting exercise. You don't really see me talking about massage that much because I'm always trying to think about moving people towards exercise. And I'll never forget the day when I had a guy come in and say, hey, I just want you to rub my leg. <laughs> I told him I wanted to work on bridges and split squats and stuff. And he had patellar tendonitis. And there, I mean, elephant in the room, no pun intended, was this guy was really overweight and out of shape. And I said to him, like, listen, to get better, you're going to have to exercise. Like, that's going to be part of the process here, not just me doing the manual skills. And he, he was hesitant. It wasn't part of his lifestyle. Uh, wasn't something he was comfortable with and, and trying to stress to them that, you know, exercise is really the game changer in this whole equation. And that's partially why we wanted that name is to, to make that part of the forefront. So people didn't just think they were coming from manual therapy and they were focusing on exercise. And it can be hard to change the mindset of someone who's injured chronically because there's that fear avoidance around doing things. But I guess it just really starts with, you know, taking baby steps into the right direction with them. What uh, what percentage of like soft tissue work are your sessions compared to movement? I, I guess it's all, yeah. I mean, it, it's always progressing. Like I always say to them, like, hey, early on, if you're someone who's coming in with really an acute issue, like you had a back spasm or you had an ankle sprain, you know, maybe it starts off being 75% manual therapy because we need to deal with that chemical pain or deal with that spasm. And then it starts to progress each session. I would say to look much less like PT or therapy or massage and look a lot more like strength and conditioning. And ideally, we want to always continue to move along that spectrum, that direction, if we're doing a good job. And, and there's still some people who come and get tr- traditional massage work to, uh, to help them with recovery. And that's great. But when we're dealing with like these acute issues, it's always progressing you know, more towards exercise as we go. Right on, man. Do you try to teach them how to do like self soft tissue therapy as you go along so that they don't really need the, the manual therapy anymore as they progress? Yeah. Yeah. And, and absolutely. So they can, how do they manage the stuff on their own? I always say like a lot of this mobility stuff that we do with them is low hanging fruit in the sense that they can learn how to do it themselves. Like I, if I'm doing a good job, it should be things that they can own and do every day. I could try to eliminate myself from that process and then turn myself more into the trainer or the capacity builder in that respect. So that's always the goal. Absolutely. Do you see that uh, when people get better, the stuff that they should continue to maintain and do, they just forget about it because they feel better. (laughs) They're like, I'm good. I don't need that anymore. Yeah. It's like you have two different types of clients, right? You have the ones that like take the whole lifestyle, like by storm, they like want to keep doing the mobility work. They want to keep doing like movement quality management and things like that but then you have some who are like 
it's like the one spot they come and they see you and then they they'll go and be gone for a while and they come back when they screw themselves up again right they don't <laughs> buy into the whole lifestyle and that's why i try, try to like i work so closely with the gym like if you, you've been there you see my office mm -hmm. attached it's in the gym mm -hmm. and i say like listen if they're an outside client they're not someone who already comes to train with us regularly my number one goal is to get them training with a coach in there if it's not with me or with somebody else so that way we can almost kind of control that a little bit more like they're seeing someone two three four days a week for training they're more likely to stay on track now obviously you know like if you train people it's hard to always get people to do what you want them to do and what they need to do but i guess that's why we're all so behavioral therapists as much as we are uh, <laughs> trainers and physical therapists right that is so true but what would you say to because there are a lot of novice train or newer trainers out there or maybe even seasoned trainers let's say you have a client who deals with rheumatoid arthritis issues like that what what would you recommend what would your advice be to a trainer that's dealing with a client that has that issue you know what i tend to always like you always have to kind of take them day by day because you know they have swings in what their symptoms can be like on a day-to-day -day basis depending on a number of factors outside of things that are our control whether it's their diet their exercise their sleep and you have to be able to look at all of those things to help make decisions and figure out why they might have a flare-up or why things might be getting worse so i mean along with maybe communicating with their rheumatologist or their their general practitioner you know, just, okay, what are they presenting with the day they come in? Because I've had people with rheumatoid that some days they feel great and you're able to get a lot done. And other days, not so much. You have to be able to say, okay, how are we going to just roll it back on this day, react to what we have presenting in front of us, and then progressively add load on the days that we feel good and try to get a handle on what gets their symptoms to get better or get worse on the day to day. So it's kind of like getting the trainer to be able to be adjustable as much as the client is. Yeah. And that's, that is really true. Especially if you work with anyone like a chronic pain condition to be able to understand that like that person might present great one day and then present really extreme with their symptoms another day. And it might not always make sense to you if you think about the traditional pain management model, but the ultimate goal of, of our job is to get them moving and do the most we can with what we have. So yeah. And, and I think that when, client, when trainers struggle the most, is when they might not be as flexible because they think like, oh, their idea of what this client should feel like or present with isn't lining up with what they come in with, right? So I think, yeah, our flexibility is just as important as the clients. So then are you guys still writing programs for, for these clients with chronic pain or are you, is just, are you doing it based on how they feel that day? Yeah, I tend to have a template always. And then that template might get progressed or regressed based on like your initial conversation with them right and something i always talk to our coaches about is like what is your initial conversation every time they come in like you should with each group of clients or each individual client you should probably have a set of questions you consistently ask hey on a scale of 110 how do you feel today what was your sleep la like last night how's your nutrition today all the things that you know when we talk about things that could drive symptoms especially for that individual client run through those kind of questions to get a feel of okay where are we on the spectrum and maybe it's because you can see how they're carrying themselves or their energy presents that day and you can say okay hey i already know for this person i'm gonna have to you know reel it back a little bit in this session or maybe it's a good day to hit the gas pedal for them right and so i think having a rough template and then being able to kind of do your coach's assessment as they walk in the door can help you kind of pick the right direction to go. I think what's uh, one of the biggest things that I've always enjoyed about your teaching is much more of that holistic approach as opposed to just that one angle that a lot of coaches, I think, unfortunately, to take is looking at all these out, out other factors. I think one of the biggest benefits simply just being outside, right? Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm out here right now. I yeah. was like, oh, I got a, a little time to talk with you guys. I was like, I might as well sit outside and, and get a little sun. But yeah, like most people don't have nearly enough vitamin D or fresh air. And I think it, when you're pent up like under artificial lights all day with recycled air all day, uh, it could do wonders for your physical and your psychological state just to get some fresh air and, and get sunlight consistently. And especially while we're dealing with things like COVID, we know there's this, like overwhelming research for how people with vitamin D deficiencies are affected most severely from COVID-19, as well as with um, a handful of other diseases, obviously, and the vitamin D deficiency. So just getting outside, exercising, and making like uh, non-exercise or non-voluntary physical activity, it's like a bigger part of your life uh, is huge. Have you had any sessions where you're like, you know what, let's stop this. Let's just go outside and let's go for a walk. Yeah, there's actually, it's funny. I got a friend down the street who we've been trying to get to exercise more. And I'll just say, Mark, when I said to him before, like, hey, we'll just come down and take a walk for you, walk with you today. 
like, let's, let's just take a walk today. I actually have a guy coming in on Thursday who I just talked to on the phone who just went through a rehab. Bigger guy, a little bit older. He's had a bunch of health issues. And I, he's going to come in. We're just going to do a 30-minute walk up and down the street. And so, yeah, I mean, sometimes that's where people need to start. And you have some clients with stress management issues that that's usually why they have these symptoms. And like maybe burying them with a trap bar deadlift and a bunch of shuttles probably isn't the best thing for their overall health today. Maybe going for a walk and like just getting outside probably adds more to their health than, you know, than crushing it in the gym on some given days. So we're also lucky that we have this turf section out back that I've been taking people. I mean, especially during COVID, we've been out there a lot. But even when before this, some of these people work inside all day. I'm like, well, if we're going to swing kettlebells, we might as well go outside and do it. You get a little bit more bang for your buck there. So always looking for that angle when whenever possible is the feedback been better with them training outdoors do they feel a little bit but more yeah. energized a little bit better yeah usually like i'll tell you like i was a little tired earlier and i was like i'm gonna go outside get answer some emails and, and then talk to you guys out here just because of the sun but yeah generally they're happier the air feels better especially during covid people are just feel safer uh but yeah i most everybody would prefer to be outside as long as the, if the weather is uh cooperating so when you're training because you guys have the cfsc one of those components is much more unilateral based training versus bilateral based training and we talk about that and we say hey, unilateral is usually a little bit better and then the, doing the bilateral domination uh, what's one of the reasons why you would tell a coach that they need to kind of maybe look at that type of programming? I think in general, like we're just unilaterally designed creatures. Like we were designed to move one limb at a time in this contralateral, like rotating pattern. So uh, generally when we want to select exercises, I think that selecting unilateral movements just carries over to much more than we do in life. And, you know, whether that means for the competitive athlete who you know, we want to prevent AC injuries and help them be able to explode off one leg better. Or if that's, you know, someone like my parents who are in their 60s, you know, to feel more confident going on a hike, to go one leg at a time with the mountain or to be able to maintain their balance. I just think there's better carryover. And then you get that the spine sparing effect most often where they're not going to have a direct compressive load on their spine. They can probably load with dumbbells or kettlebells or vests or sandbags and get the overload effect that we're looking for as opposed to to back squatting the bar. Your CFSC, uh, for those who don't know, is Certified Functional Strength Coach, and you are one of the creators behind that program. What are some of the core principles behind the CFSC? The number one thing I want to try to get people to come out of the course thinking, it's like my number one goal, is just systems-based approach to training. I always say, like, you don't have to leave the course with the same exercise selection as me. You don't have to even share all the same beliefs as me. But if you go back to wherever it is you work, whether it's in physical therapy or strength conditioning or whatever it is that you do, and you think about building a system that's consistent based on the principles that we talk about, then it's a win for us. Because I think too far often the reason we built this cert is that we saw a lot of coaches, they couldn't tell us what their belief system was. And we taught all these mentorships and things. They just kind of like, oh, this is like, kind of what i saw on the internet this week so this is what we're training this week like they, they like they scribble down the exercise on the whiteboard right before whereas like i could tell you very clearly like this is why we progress split squats the way we do or this is why we focus on anti-training like anti-rotation anti-extension before teaching active movements and things like that and so i want people to have a belief system so at the end of the day that is the number one takeaway that i think we want from the course is just a systems-based approach to to what you do i think what's great about that is it it doesn't matter what setting you're in it doesn't matter what what tools you have you just you're able to train someone no matter what yeah and and that's really how it should be because like at the end of the day you could have a big fancy facility like ours or you could be you know working with a set of dumbbells or or just a stick like i learned so much from taking the course with dennis when he came i was like you can do so much with just a couple pieces of equipment if you know how to apply them and you know what positions to get it and whatnot and so i think when you look at courses across the board that you want to take you're looking for some thought system that works under principles like that and applies them no matter what the, the tool is right yeah and that's it's hard to get that through to coaches and understanding that your principles are everything so you have to have that foundation because so many coaches are just like you referred to just a few minutes ago they just want the exercises they just want 
know, yeah. what, what looks cool, you know, what, what the circus tricks are. But everything has a principle behind it. And that's really what people need to understand is you have to grasp those principles. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, after the course, which well, thank you for hosting again, by the way, that was awesome. What's what's one of the biggest ways that you utilize the stick in regards to your program? Uh, I do a ton of isometrics with people when they like early on in that rehab process, like when I was talking about taking people from manual therapy into training, usually our first stop in the strength portion is isometrics because there isn't going to be a huge inflammatory effect. It's going to be safer and under control. And there's less of like a high metabolic demand. I can start to just do it right in my office. We come off the table, we go right to the wall, get the stick or go right to the floor and get the stick. That's been hugely viable for us. And I have, it's funny, I have all the sticks like right outside the door of my office. If you ever see the videos I film, they're like right in there. And they, uh, I immediately start, we get them in like the horse stance. We start with the, anti, especially with the, some of the low back pain people, like with those wall isometric anti-rotation drills or uh, dead bug drills and being able to start to teach them the brace and the stick provides a, a great tool to start to teach them that with a low demand. And when you talk about people being able to do stuff at home, I either just lend out the sticks to them, but then they can just take them and bring them back. And it's not like they need a whole gym set up to start to do some of those things. What, uh, what level of isometrics are you, are you getting into, I guess, duration and intensity before you move them on to, you know, loaded movement? Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing I'm trying to get them to understand is just the positioning. Like, okay, how mm -hmm. do I get this proximal stability where I get their rib cage and their pelvis together and then working them from the ground up. So whether it's me having them in tall kneeling and then half kneeling and then standing and having them work through breaths. So mm -hmm. I'll essentially say, Hey, I need you to think start at about 50% intensity into the wall, take three long, hard breaths for me and I'll build a little volume that way. And then start to kind of build them up to, to really understand positioning. Cause I find a lot of the clients that come in, it's a motor control issue in that they don't know how to disassociate joints, right? Like they don't know how to maintain their pelvic position without compensating, or they don't know how to, you know, flex their shoulder without extending their spine, vice versa, isolating movements. And, and so the stick again, provides a good tool to teach them where to put tension, which is usually a root, a lot of their, the issues they come in with. The lack of body awareness is, is pretty prevalent. Jordan. You see a lot of lack of body awareness and a lot of trainers out there too. Oh, yeah. Very Absolutely. Nice. Like when we teach the CFSC and we do the motor control portion and, and take them through that, I think lots of times we end up identifying things in the coaches where they need work just as much as tools to help them improve the client's movement quality as well. <laughs> Well, I think the one thing with the CFSC that I really like is the fact that you're, you're showing all the different phases where you're showing the importance of mobility. You're showing the, the importance of the different aspects of strength training, but then you're also showing the different the importance of recovery work also. So you, that yeah. is something that's massively, uh, I think, missing in a lot of programs. Yeah, I think that it's funny. Things like cool downs and recovery and mobility, are, it, most courses, again, they, they want the exercises, but they especially you want the sexy exercises. Mm -hmm right? They don't yes. want the stuff that like, isn't going to get the Instagram likes. The average fitness industry consumer is looking for entertainment, as I always say, as, oh, as opposed like to training. They want <laughs> entertainment. And so, so, but I think if we're going to give quality education, we have to think about providing everything on the spectrum. And that mm -hmm. means, you know, recovery, that means mobility, that means training and conditioning uh, the whole, the whole gamut. So, um, I think we always got to continue to think, how can we deliver everything uh, that I think we everybody needs? What are some signs that you're overtraining? Let's say I'm just a Joe Schmo who is working out. What are some things that I need to look for that would be keys of that I'm doing a little too much? Number one, I think disinterest in training. If you have someone who is normally very interested in coming in and, and energized to be there, and they are a little bit more apathetic about training, that usually is an overtrain a sign of overtraining. If they're less interested in the process lack of sleep disrupted sleep is is a big one i know for me that's usually the first thing i notice if i'm if i'm doing too much my sleep isn't quite as good changes in appetite you should can see some extreme changes either in being extremely hungry I, that's another one for me i find with my appetite goes to the roof like okay that might be a sign i'm doing too much and, and, and maybe not fueling adequately for the amount of work i'm doing so I, again i think the a daily questionnaire is huge and it can be as simple as like the questions I tend to ask are from one to five, how sore are you today? How much energy do you have today? How well did you sleep last night? How interested are you in training today? And so you just go through those and, and I think consistently if you ask the same questions over and over, you can start to identify when someone has a blip that's outside of a normal radar. 
right? And they'll be like, oh, I'm pretty tired today or oh, I'm not that excited to be here today. Like, for instance, I have one client. I see him very early in the morning and normally like we can always banter and I can usually tell right away within the first five minutes by how talkative he is. Like while we're doing our mobility work that I'm like, ah, we're going to let off the gas pedal today because he's a lawyer, high overworked, not enough sleep, trains very frequently. And so like sometimes just by the energy and the conversation that client puts off, usually I can start to tell like, all right, this is what we're going to roll it back a little bit today. Do you guys use any tech at all for HRV or anything like to, to see how people are doing? I personally use the aura ring for okay. myself. I've gotten used to like using that data, but I mean, not everyone's going to have the resources necessarily to do that. Everybody use a my zone heart monitor with the screens up on the gym with all the heart rate, real simple way. I'll tell them like, listen, understand what your waking heart rate is every day. Like if you're always waking up and you're like at 48 beats per minute consistently, and then you wake up uh, a few days in a row and you're around 60, you're probably overtrained, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's a real simple one. Like if you have an elevated heart rate, that, that and that's usually also goes hand in hand, like when you don't sleep as well. Like when I would look on my aura ring, when my sleep was disrupted for overtraining, my resting body temp and my resting heart rate while I was sleeping were always elevated because I'm typically like 44 beats a minute overnight. So if they do have access to those, those would be the markers I, I, I would look for. Have you found that uh, aura ring to be pretty accurate? So based on how you feel and the numbers you get? Um, it can be. Sometimes you'll look at it and be like, oh, I feel good today. I tend to be able to tell people like, because I have some real tight days that, that have an aura ring or have whoop or, or something along those lines. And they're like, get too obsessed with it. They're like, no, it says I can't train. I can't train today. And I'm like, well, it's one data point. It's just one data point. So you have to look at it and realize there's going to be individual variants, just like a heart rate monitor has variants. So you have to look at it and say, okay, how do I feel like I slept? How does this thing say I slept? How do I feel right now? And what other factors do I have in my week and my life to help me make this decision? So um, sometimes, I'll, it's, it, sometimes it's very obvious. Like I always said when I use the aura ring, I almost wish that it's kind of spoke to me like in like a sarcastic, disparaging tone because like I'm an East Coast guy like, <laughs> Oh, Kevin, you finally got a good night of sleep tonight. Like, I hope, I hope you're proud of yourself. Like, I would respond better to that type of coaching. Uh, but, like, yeah, I mean, so, so, sometimes I do disagree with that. I'm like, oh, no, I feel great today. But then maybe a couple of days later, I realize why it was telling me what it told me because then it ends up biting me in the ass and I crash a couple of days. So you just have to kind of work in that data point just like your own subjective feelings to help you make better decisions. And, and that's why I always explain to people who – use tech as part of the decision making process it's just another data point that's awesome do you find that with like what you just referred to as far as coaching styles i get that a lot out here because it's i grew up in buffalo like i got that northeast nah. mentality it's it's just like you said i i respond differently to that type of sarcasm and that's right up my alley and it's hard yeah. out here on the West Coast to kind of, and even 20 years later, I'm still kind of like, oh, I have to catch myself every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah see, it's easy. It yeah. 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 I'm, uh, I'm like born and raised here. And like, I like the people in this area are very much like me. But Brendan commented the same thing when he went to California. He said he had he challenged his communication skills because the average communication out there is much less kind of dry or like a lot of ball busting uh, in our gym, I'm sure with most of our clients where uh, yeah. maybe on the West coast, that's not going to be as easily tolerated as a communication style from a coach. So yeah, I think you have to adjust on everybody that you, that you deal with. <laughs> and it's hard because after you've grown up your whole life, just that's just the way you communicate. Right. <laughs> exactly. Sherry, Sherry says it to me all the time. She's like, New York, she likes to just say New York, and I'll be like, all right, all right. Yeah. That's, the, that's the code word right yeah, like New York. Yeah. I'll be like, all right, calm it down. I'll be like, all right. Got to tone it down a little, that type of thing. What do you have uh, in the works coming up? Well, it's been funny. So, obviously, COVID has thrown our workshop travel, like, for a loop as, as mm -hmm. it has for you guys as well. I mean, I was traveling, you know, you know, two weekends a month at least before this, and right now we've kind of shifted to all these Zoom virtual courses. So, Brendan Rear just did one this past weekend. He's doing one this coming Sunday, August 23rd, uh, a level one live through Zoom. And then it's associated with our existing online course that's on Inspire 360. So they sign up for that, then they get access to the Zoom course as well. So they can have that live portion along with it. And then we're going to do a few more of those coming in September, September 18th, 19th, and 20th. We have level one, level two, back to back 
online as well. And that's going to be right out of the gym here because we're not going to host a live one. We are going to film one and put it out there for everyone. So that's really what we have coming up. And I have a book that's coming out in the end of the year or start of 2021. So uh, called Anatomy of Functional Training through Human Kinetics. And that's all written out of my hands. And hopefully that'll be coming coming towards the end of the year or the start of 2021. So Nice, man. Congratulations. Congratulations on that. That's awesome. Yeah, v- very excited. A lot of hard work. Myself and Mary Kate Fight, who's a former Boyles employee and works at uh, Springfield College. It's a professor. And what we really do is kind of take the exercises in our program, like the things we teach at CFSC. And I don't know if you've seen these anatomy and motion books from Human Kinetics, but they we do pictures of people doing the exercises and they draw the anatomy over it. So you'll, you'll see someone like doing a split squat with like their adductors and their VMO and their obliques all drawn in with explanations of why we choose these exercises and how we coach them and whatnot. So yeah, I'm really excited about it. It should be, should be pretty cool. That's awesome, awesome man. Yeah. COVID wise, I did listen to Mike on the Strength Coach podcast, I believe it was last month, and he kind of talked about his personal feelings on the reopening and closing of gyms, so to speak, and that back and forth. Mm-hmm. So that's been quite interesting. Team. You guys are currently open, correct? Correct. Yeah, we are open and we're well below our normal capacity based on the guidelines, but we're as filled as we probably can be just about with the current capacity limit that we have, which is good. I mean, if you're thinking about glass half full, there's a lot of gyms that are probably in worse shape than us, especially in the surrounding areas, but but we, we are open and operating, so that, that's good. Have you guys had to change a lot of programming because you can't have, you know, the, the same amount of groups or maybe equipment has to be further away from each other? You should see the rearrangements we've done. And it's like for the first few weeks, it was seemingly like every week, every couple of days, really, we were just moving equipment around to give you an idea. Like when we first opened, we were outside only. Mike and Bob got a big, big circus like tent that went over the turf and we had eight stations lined up. So we every day. As a staff, we'd come in, we'd bring out all the bikes, bring out all the pads, bring in all the dumbbells, bring in all the kettlebells, bring in all everything outside. At the end of the night, we bring it all back. (laughs) And then when we could start to go inside, what we did is we created in each room, we created like a pod. We can have eight people at a time in there based on our space. So eight pods where everyone gets their dumbbells, everyone gets their stick, everyone gets their kettlebell. Everyone gets their pull-up rack. We just moved. We bought three more racks so everyone could have individual rack. We bought three more Kaisers so everyone could have an individual Kaiser, installed those. So yeah, it's been like, it's a complete overhaul of the program, mainly just to fit the logistics because at the end of the day, that's got to be the limiting factor for us more than anything else. But uh, we've been lucky that, you know, our, Many of our clients have come back. We still continue doing Zoom workouts for the ones that have not come back. And yeah, we're, we, we've been able to bounce back given the, the restrictions that the government has, uh, has given us. Did they, uh, did they tell you guys to restrict like cardiovascular activities too? I know here, that, no, was, some, not really. that was one of the restrictions. Yeah. 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 Well, well, so everything shut down again here, but initially yeah. they said, yeah. Hey, you gotta, you gotta yeah. tape up and block off all cardio equipment. Oh, wow. I'd say I haven't heard. I didn't hear that. That's interesting. Ours are just like, if, if you don't have a barrier, everyone has to be six feet apart. If you do, uh, or if you do have a barrier, you have to be six feet apart. If you don't have a barrier, you have to be 14 feet apart where the other guidelines that we have. So right now everybody's 14 feet apart. Luckily, like we have a large space, so so we can do that. But if you're operating a small training studio, 14 feet in between clients mean you have maybe like two clients in that space. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Time if you're in there also. So, I, and, and there's some areas of Boston that aren't reopened. Like Somerville as a city, it's like a, a little city on the edge of Boston. It's like edge of Boston proper. They haven't, they're not allowing any gyms to open. And there's a lot oh. of, you know, good gyms in that, that area that, that are still not open. Whereas if we've been open since the end of June. So it, it's, uh, there's a little bit of variety depending on where you live. Do you feel that there's a huge disconnect between the medical society and us as a fitness industry on the benefits that we bring in regards to COVID of, of what yeah. movement can do? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I, I'm a firm believer and probably one of the most outspoken people. I think exercise is the most powerful drug that we have to help our immune system and help our long-term health. Um, I think that it's probably a disconnect between the lawmakers, the government, and the medical community, especially because I think when they when they think gym, they don't think of walking into where you guys are. They don't think about walking into where we are. They think about Planet Fitness, and they think, oh, there's no way that that place can maintain cleanliness. There's no way that place can maintain distance. Whereas if they probably go into a gym like yours or mine, and they see all the open space, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a much different story, and the model of training is much different. 
uh, mm-hmm. as far as like you have control over space and equipment and size and all these things. I mean, I think it's good when these groups of people, whether it's in New York or Massachusetts or California, I know that have lobbied the government and lobbied uh, the health pe- the health people to them to understand like, hey, we're offering a different service. We're in a different space and what we can provide can actually help people. It's just, you know, it's tough because while you're fighting that battle, there's businesses that are going out of business. and. So you just hope that, that we can get that message across to them to, to value it as much as possible. Because I saw New York open today or is opening in like a week, right? As oh, of today, yes. they're letting yes. gyms, gyms start to reopen. So that's at least good to hear. And hopefully you guys will be back open soon, yeah, but who knows? They don't even, they, we don't even have a timeline. Yeah, right we don't have any timeline currently. Yeah, so, I mean, I know Mike had talked about civil unrest, uh, or civil disobedience, I should say, was the key, was the phrase he used. Is this bringing, is this COVID... Uh, bringing around a little bit more awareness of maybe how unhealthy we've been as a nation. Oh, my God. Dude, I was looking at this stat about Japan versus the United States with coronavirus deaths. Have you, and Japan's, what, 100, some, 100 million people or so on that are there or somewhere around that number? And, but they showed, like, from a percentage standpoint, how many less deaths there were than in the United States. But there's also so almost zero obesity in that country. Like there's very, yeah. very low obesity in Japan as a country. So, I mean, that obviously plays an effect. I mean, there's, you can't jump dance around the fact that the lack of preventative health that we've you know thrown to the side for years, not managing health with daily exercise, nutrition, sleep management, all these things sets you up for all these you know, chronic long-term diseases, whether it's diabetes, Alzheimer's, or makes you more susceptible to something like COVID from an immune system standpoint, we're kind of caught with our pants down, right? Mm -hmm. And it's too late now. If people have been talking about this, like, oh, we need to boost our immune system. There's no like acute thing you can do. Exercise helps with your immune system to be able to fight things like a coronavirus. Uh, it's nothing you can do. It's that vitamin C packet you threw in your water is not going (laughs) to save you now (laughs) if you weren't exercising for the last like two years. So, uh, it, and it's something that people need to kind of get wrap their head around. And it's a long-term approach to, to health and fitness. Because the one thing I've seen, at least out here, more of is more people out on the trails finally. For sure. You know, we go, we That's get to it. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. It sh- but it shouldn't have taken corona to get people out on no. the trails you know yeah and you hope that when people go back to their normal routines that they don't just stop doing that right you hope that they open it open their eyes to like oh my god what how great do i feel getting out and hiking multiple days a week only to go back to their job and go back to the old you know day-to-day grind that they were already on go backwards so i mean i, I did notice that as well you see more people out hiking and, and doing all these things and i think it, it just it should have opened people's eyes to, to prioritizing these things and not just taking advantage of it when they're forced to stay home. Well, I know for people that don't know, Kevin is getting married soon. Has, yes. Has, so now this is probably throwing a wrench into your wedding plans coming up as far as... Uh, there's been there's been a few wrenches, yeah. So uh, <laughs> we, uh, we were supposed to get married in Italy. We were supposed to get married in Italy in uh, oh. October. The travel ban has yep. uh, obviously... Uh, the EU does not want us. Nope. So uh, <laughs> we, will, we will not be going to Italy. We had to scrap that. But we are planning to go to Vermont in just a little over a month and get married. So um, September 20th is the plan. Vermont is, you know, next state over and we're both in like low risk areas. So, so we, sh- we are planning to make that work. So uh, God forbid anything crazy happens, but that's the plan. <laughs> uh, how many people are you allowed to have? I think it'll be about four, 40 people, okay. which is, we wanted something kind of small anyways. Yeah. And you know, uh, hell or high water, she's going to make it happen. On this <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> coronavirus or not, <laughs> pandemic or no pandemic, we will be getting married then. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the plan. But I mean, Vermont's beautiful state, real spread out, real rural, obviously, and kind of nice place up there to go to. But so it should be easy. We can just drive right up there. It's been frustrating looking at how we've handled it as a nation versus other countries. It's been quite interesting just sitting back and not taking left, right, side, none of that crap. Just uh-huh. looking at statistics and looking how this whole thing has been handled. It's just been a shit yeah. show. Yeah, you look at uh, the two things. One, how people manage their health, whether it's like we talked about Japan and the U.S. like being fighting obesity and being chronically active, but then also like tight cultures versus loose cultures, right? Ones that really follow. Japan is also a really tight mm-hmm. culture from a politeness standpoint and a uh, rule standpoint. So like when they said put on masks, like they were, they were, they were already wearing masks whenever mm-hmm. they were sick. And they, there's already social distancing. They don't really shake hands. So you see how it changes things right and like 
in the U.S., obviously we identify with freedoms, which are great. But at the same time, it might hold us back when we have to be adjustable to, to certain limitations as far as things like masks and whatnot. So it, it's been interesting. And like, so our venue in Italy, where we were supposed to have the wedding, they're open. I've just been watching their Instagram. They're having like parties, they're having weddings and all this. And I'm like, I just can't get there. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, they're, they're open. So I think they're actually starting to backslide in Italy now too. So, so you never know uh, what's going to happen in the next two, three, four months, it'll be be interesting to see where all these different countries kind of kind of trend to. It is interesting how you just referred to in Japan and in Asia, they're, we're, they're packed in, but there isn't a lot of handshaking and there isn't a lot of hugging. It, mm-hmm. it, it is a lot more non-contact in, in a lot of respects. It, it's not something I actually thought about until you just said that. So that is a, that is a really good point. Whereas in Italy, everything's about hugging and kissing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you can see yeah. where that would be in. I, well, I think it's also interesting to see the difference in the way different countries, even within the European Union, went about their different protocols. Yeah, I, I mean, like, so Germany, another real tight culture, and as far as the rules go, they seem to deal with it very efficiently, from what I understand. But then I think uh, areas like the UK, I think, are, I think are still struggling, from what I understand, mm-hmm. uh, similarly as, as we are. So I, it, it will be interesting. I mean, you think hopefully in a couple of years, we look back and are able to prospectively look at this and be away from it and kind of see what can we learn from the whole process. And like we were saying, I hope the biggest thing we take away is there's a a new prioritization on on health, preventative health and not reactive health. Because I I think we could all probably agree here that that's probably the most valuable tool we have to deal with this, that we were not ready. Most people were not prepared (laughs) to, to, to deal with it with their own immune system. So I think the U.S. is like, I think we have 50, is it 50 or 60% of the people are obese? But the adult population, yeah, something it's, like that. it's something, crazy. It's, it's crazy. But I think yeah, what's interesting is if we're using the BMI, many of us who hit the gym technically are obese, according to the BMI. The old yeah, yeah. From, if, if you're carrying muscle mass, but yeah, I, I yeah. went to the doctor and, and I'm like, you can look at me clearly and see I'm not carrying a huge excess uh, of body fat. But if you're, you know, six foot, 215 pound guy, that that's probably classifies you into that scale. You know, I, I'd rather be that than be, you know, uh, yeah. someone with, with no muscle definition or someone without the aerobic capacity along with it. So mm. um, again, you, you, you want doctors who look at the same variables that we look at, like, Ideally, a doctor should be able to, you know, talk to you about a fitness regimen or talk to you about, you know, your aerobic capacity, but no doctors, they don't provide that education, right? And so in the lecture I've given in the past, that movement is medicine talk, I've said like, we, you see our trainer, you're, you see you have way more contact with your clients than your uh, clients do with their doctor, right? They might see their doctor once or twice a year. They're seeing you once or twice a week, uh, minimum, usually. So again, hopefully that well, once people are comfortable going into gyms again, we can start to reestablish those relationships and make the physical, the physical therapist or the personal trainer part of an actual medical team consistently, as opposed to being like a luxury for, for some people, right? Finding ways to make it accessible for people and, and you know, make people look to them as preventative healthcare practitioners, not just uh, entertainment and luxury. Yeah, it'd be pretty cool if, you know, your your yearly physical was like, hey, here's your, we're going to do an aerobic capacity test. We're going to do, we're going to test your strength. We're going to do your blood test. And then we're going to test your, your mobility. And you Absolutely. have those, like, those four things. And you can, I mean, that's going to be, that'd be a really good screen for someone. That is what it should be. And it just was to take a huge overhaul of the medical model to make that happen. But I think that, that we could make a push or you can at least start to get doctors who bring that in as part of what they do. There's no reason why they shouldn't be able to do that. Well, in, in fact, I'm an insurance company CEO. I'm just looking at numbers and I want to reduce, of course, money out. So I think being more preventative and incentivizing my my customer base to be more preventative is going to help me in the pocketbook in the long run. Absolutely, it should, right? And so I, I think there's probably some private, you know, concierge doctors or like like that do things like this. And I think the big key is getting it to an economic accessory to people who, who might not be able to afford a private doctor or, or you know, high level medical care to have doctors at all levels through insurance, like you said, who are able to 
start to look at preventative health markers like like Neil mentioned all across the board. And that, I think that's how you change the health country because you see like things like COVID obviously disproportionately affect people with lower income. And so, you know, being able to provide training and, and preventative health strategies to them, I think is, is the key. If you go in for your yearly checkup and the doctor does all the blood panels and blah, blah, blah. And then he or she says, oh, by the way, you need to exercise. It's just like t- your parents talking. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like your parents talking to you. After a while, you just block them out. Yeah, and it doesn't help when the doctor doesn't exercise himself. Like, are you going to look at your doctor and be like, oh, yeah, I'll take advice from you, buddy? Because that's how it is half the time. And it's like, what kind of exercise are you doing, too, right? Are you going to tell someone to just lift weights and not work on the aerobic? There's no specificity in what that patient should do. Yeah, and like I always say, like, the majority of doctors, they don't get they get maybe a week of exercise and nutrition education in their entire medical Mm. education. And that's, I'm not saying it's because they're neglectful. There's a lot they have to learn. Like I can't, I can't do surgery. I couldn't perform a physical on someone the way they do, but you know, there has to be uh, an inclusion of this preventative care that is prioritized. And right now it just isn't. And so, like you said, like saying, Oh yeah, you should exercise. Oh, what's the recommendation of three times for a minimum of 20 minutes a week at moderate to high intensity. (laughs) Okay. Thanks. What does that mean to the average person? (laughs) Nothing. Yeah. But if they could say, Hey, every doctor is like, Oh, I, you know, I work closely with this trainer is the person I'm going to refer you to just like they refer medicine, right? They have no problem writing a script for some sort of medication that could have a bunch of side effects and uh, might not necessarily get you better, but they're not ever really saying, Oh, go to this trainer. Right. And I think if you build a medical model, that is directly connected to fitness where like doctors refer to trainers and trainers refer to doctors and there's this cyclical process, then you're putting people in positions to get better. And right now, that's just not the way it's seen because training isn't looked at as health. Training is looked at as entertainment or looked at as a luxury, not necessarily looked at as a piece of the preventative healthcare model like it, like it really should be. Yeah, I think the only way we get there too is if we had a um, like a board certification, right? Exactly. As a trainer. Exactly. Or instead of all these different certifications everywhere, maybe we still, we still have those, you know, as, as specialties or continuing education, but until we actually have like a, a bar type exam, like lawyers go through, you know, it, we're, I don't think it'll be taken seriously by that field. No, it's so crazy that you, and you say that because like training is like the wild west. It's all privatized certs. Like you and I know we, we have them, but we've all tried to put our best foot forward to create something that we think is great. Right. But like as a massage therapist, I had to go to school. I had to take a state licensure. I had to go through all that. Just like, like that's what hairdressers and barbers have to do and, and all these other professions. But for some reason, training gets like just in the, it's like the wild west of private certifications. And, and, you know, everyone has a different acronym uh, that they're working off of. Like, and so you're right. There needs to be a national qualifier and I know some people get scared of that because they're like, oh, I don't want the government telling me what's acceptable training. But at some point, we need to work with the regulatory people and work with you know government boards to try to raise the, the, the tide line for everyone, I think. Yeah, it's kind of illogical when you think about a cosmetologist out here in California needs 1500 hours but you can get certified in a weekend or yeah. <laughs> to deal with the human body. It, it, there's really no logical thought process behind that. I think if you were an alien and you were visiting our planet, you would scratch your head over that one. You'd be like, that just doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Like I needed 750 hours for massage and I'd go through all this testing and ultimately schooling. And, and, and I think to myself, I'm like, wow, imagine if I, uh, all the people that train people, I'd go through that. You definitely see higher quality practice in, and that's why even for our, for MBSC, we don't hire anyone who doesn't do the internship. Like they, mm-hmm. we almost put them through our, our own ringer for three months. Mm-hmm. And because for us, like I, you could come in with any resume, but until I see you out here coaching and I'm able to work with you and see what your work ethic is like and see what your coaching skills and communication skills are like, then, then we're not going to hire you. So, I mean, there would be less of a need for that process where we put them through that internship process if if there was a qualifying standard that was higher. Is that is that a forty day? Is that a forty hour internship per week? Then are they putting it in the full time? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, they're there. It's really coaching intensive, and and so like for instance, in the summer there are, it's four days, but you're definitely there for four like forty hours. It's Monday through Thursday, but they're there early, helping to open the gym. They're coaching all day, and they're out at the end of the night. And then fall, winter, spring, 
it's either Monday through Friday or Monday, Thursday, Saturday, Monday through Thursday and Saturday. And same thing, it's, it's definitely over 40 hours. They get their share of, of coaching time and, and education time while they're here for, sh- for sure. And that's one of the things that's really set you guys above as far as being the top of the creme of the creme is because your standards are that high. And I mean, think about how many hours of coaching that is in three months. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. I, it was like a fast forward on my career. I could never, I came into this place clueless. I didn't know who Mike was. I just applied because I, I lived 25, 30 minutes away from here. I didn't know I knew who Mike was. But after going through it, all of a sudden, I realized like, oh my God, I just got a whole bunch of experience crammed into June, July, August. And, yeah. and then I all of a sudden, I kept just, that's why I kept coming back. I'm like, I think I can squeeze a little bit more out of this. And so, yeah, I mean, I, and I think that's what we need to do to ensure good entry level hires is to put them through that that intense learning experience where they're coaching a lot and sucking a lot of stuff in and making mistakes importantly and learning from them. Yeah, because a new trainer at a 24-hour fitness, they might not get 40 hours of training in a month. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and most importantly, I was surrounded by people who were my peers or people who I could learn from. Like I always say, when I started at MBSC, when I, I think about the coaches that were here when I started, it's like my Mount Rushmore. You know, aside from Mike, there was, you know, Nicole Rodriguez, there was Jamie Rodriguez, there was Anthony Mirando, there was Dan Gableman, there was uh, Josh Bonatal. There's all these these coaches who are in all these great places now who were kind of like my my teachers, right? And so I was in an environment also where, you know, I, I had people who were helping me learn. And sometimes you go into, like you said, like a 24-hour fitness and you're a contracted personal trainer, you're just doing your own thing every day, right? So you don't have anyone to tell you and pull you aside and say, hey, you're screwing this up. Or uh, why don't you try it this way? And for me, that, that that's life-changing. the environment that I was surrounded by and that we're able to give the interns that, that come in here. And I think the difference is, is in your surrounding, you had coaches that were willing to give you input and to see you progress versus a, a 24-hour where it's pretty cutthroat, where coaches want to cut you. Their, their, uh, their objective is to knock you down a peg so that they look better. And that's that's a huge difference in, in in energy and teamwork there, or lack of teamwork. Yeah, you know it's a, it's funny because I've I worked at a Gold's Gym when I was like eighteen, right before I started here, and a completely different environment. When you think like most of these people are private contractors, they're just thinking about you said like getting their clients in, looking good. They don't give a shit about the the gym itself as much as they care about just you know, go built pad and their stats. Whereas here, like we don't take any private contractors. We're only employees. And so everybody is trying to kind of push the train forward collectively in, in, and that's huge. Yeah. That's a big, big difference in dynamics there. Team versus individual is, is really important there. And truthfully, we couldn't operate without, uh, we couldn't operate without our interns and without our younger staff, like, especially in the summer. I mean, I mean, we don't have interns right now because of COVID. Mm -hmm. We had to cut it for the summer just because of capacity limits, but typically like we couldn't operate this business without them, especially in the summer, because there's just so many bodies in this place. And that's Mm -hmm. the beautiful part of it as an intern is you get a lot of opportunities to coach, but we need them. So like uh, our business running depends on like us, like our senior staff, Steve Bigelow, Vinny, Dan, myself, getting all these coaches ready. We have like a two week training camp almost that we call it before the summer starts where they come in and we're doing like, it's like being at, at uh, mini camp for, for football. It's like being at, at training camp. And we do like two weeks of everybody goes back to the education again. And we all train and we're all there all day together. And we're all going back through it and planning for the summer. And then they get thrown right into the mix two weeks later. And then we're just kind of learning uh, on our feet as we go. Oh, that's awesome. So yeah. for any uh, young aspiring listeners out there that want to get into this health and fitness industry as far as coaching, make sure you send your resume into Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. You never know. You might get added on. And uh, I'll, Please I'll do. definitely put that stamp of approval on that program. That's definitely a program you want to get involved in. Um, did you want to uh, can you share your uh, social media handles so the listeners know who to yep. follow and where to look up information? Yeah, so you find pretty much through Instagram would be the best way to find any of our stuff. So whether it's at Movement is Medicine, as usually I put out mostly educational content or at Certified FSC for, for most of our upcoming events is usually where I'll put anything uh, training related on there that you can find. Fantastic. And now you are, I credit you. Now I'm not a big beer guy, but I will credit Kevin with introducing me to probably what is my favorite beer company, Lord Hobo Brewing Company. And, uh, 
And a huge benefit, I would assume, is training next to the brewery itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can literally, if I walk around the building here, it's right on the other side. So like I said, I'm probably going to work out a couple friends right after this, and then I'm going to go over there after that. So I, I, right <laughs> it's a very short time. <laughs> uh, the only bummer about it being introduced to such a great beer is it's not available out here in California. So uh, I just, can't believe they're not distributed there. I ask everywhere. I'm like, I even... I, w I go on Lord Hobo's social media sometimes. Every once in a while, and I'll ping him a question. I'll just be like, California, please. I'll just be like, hello. Yes, so, please. Just chirp them. You're right. I just got to keep chirping them. I don't, I don't know why we're, they're not out here yet. Yeah, you I know never what? heard I'm gonna of it I'm going to put some in a box and drop it in the mail. I'm going to send some in the mail to you all guys. Right, I'm going to send you a care oh, package. You, oh, you are the man, see? I because will. Neil's never had any. Yeah, and I'm a beer guy. So. Yeah, he's a big beer oh, guy. Okay. And I keep I'm telling him, I'm like, a care package. Yeah. I'm like, you've <laughs> got to try this Lord Hobo, bro. It is so good. I was like, I had never had it. The first time we went out, we went to the rest the brewery, actually, uh, the restaurant. Yeah. Uh, I think it was the boom sauce that I had. And I took a first sip. And I was like, oh, this is freaking tasty. I was like, and as a non-beer guy, like for me to say that, I was like, this is freaking tasty. And uh, so it was yeah. really good. So I appreciate that. So thank you very much. No, you Kevin, won't. thank you very much for joining us. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for the information. Uh, excellent, excellent information as always. You are one of our favorite people to talk to and learn from. So uh, you've always got great information. So we look forward to having you again on in the not too distant future. Always a pleasure, guys. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Always good to talk to you. Excellent. To all the listeners out there, thank you for dropping in. And until next episode, be good to each other.